Silent Hill Shattered Memories A game that originally started as a port of the original Silent Hill would become one of the most interesting games in the series post-Team Silent. Released on the Wii, it would try new things with the system and attempt to change the series overall. It was, as a whole, a total reimagining of the first game in the series and wanted to present the events in an entirely new light. Today, I'm going to dive deep into Silent Hill Shattered Memories. I'll be talking about gameplay, story, mechanics, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous videos in the series, it would probably make sense to do so now. Silent Hill Shattered Memories is a reimagining of the first game, and having that context will probably make more sense. Spoiler alert for Silent Hill Shattered Memories. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I want to talk about Silent Hill Shattered Memories. The development of Silent Hill Shattered Memories went through three different stages before a final project was decided upon and approved by Konami. At first, Sam Barlow, the Silent Hill Origins director, wanted to make a new Silent Hill game on the PSP. Silent Hill's producer suggested creating a first-person shooter for the Wii instead. This led to the first project in the development of this game. Brahms PD. This was originally meant to be a spin-off game focusing on an amnesiac police detective who was searching for his partner. The player would periodically have sessions with a police psychiatrist, making the game an interactive psychological horror. The project was abandoned after Konami didn't provide their approval. The project then evolved into a new installment in the series called Silent Hill Cold Heart. The story revolved around 19-year-old college student Jessica Chambers. There was a body temperature system, and the game focused on survival, requiring the player to scavenge for food and clothing. The game retained the psych profile system from Brahms PD, where Jessica would have regular sessions with her psychologist, profiling the player. The team met with real psychiatrists to try and get research on questioning the players. They wanted to focus on a cold, snowy atmosphere as it would limit the players' visibility and produce dread. Climax was apprehensive as they thought this proposal would not impress the producers, so they again changed lanes. Eventually, the team moved towards a reimagining of the first game in the series. It had already been previously suggested in development, so they knew that Konami would approve. The game would reflect on the original title and look at it from a new light. Climax wanted to focus on the scenario and less on combat. The game was officially announced in the May 2009 issue of Nintendo Power. The game was originally meant to be released on October 13th, 2009, but was pushed back to November 3rd. The game was then pushed back again to December 8th, 2009, which was its final release date. I'm here to briefly give my obligatory notes. As we all should know if you've seen my previous videos, Silent Hill's true story is hidden beneath the surface. A first viewing of the story could lead some astray and requires further examination to reveal the true tale. I will at first give a surface-level explanation and analysis of my playthrough, going through mechanics and the story. At the end, I'll then go over the real story to find out what really happened in Silent Hill Shattered Memories. As far as versions go here, I had quite a few issues trying to emulate Shattered Memories. The Dolphin emulator version, which I bought a Dolphin sensor bar and three separate Wiimotes, don't ask, to play on my PC, dropped frames like crazy and had quite a few glitches. Upon further research, this was a pretty common issue. The PCSX2 emulated PlayStation 2 port was actually playable but had even more graphical glitches, making the footage not great to look at. I ended up being able to play the PSP port of the game with some distracting flashlight glitches. 
Thankfully, Levon has agreed to let me use their footage for the game for reference, though I'll be talking about my own experiences with the game. Silent Hill Shattered Memories opens with found footage. Our menu system controls a camera playing footage on a television. We see tapes of a daughter and her father at an amusement park. After this, we see a doctor in his office being told a patient is ready, and simultaneously, our main character is crashing into a fence. We're quickly thrust into our first psych profile. These are sessions with Dr. Kaufman where he will ask us questions about ourselves. This will change events in the game's story, giving each player a slightly different experience. These remind me a lot of the Until Dawn psych profiling sections, changing your playthrough based on evaluations that a character gives you. This questionnaire will affect our entire game, the ending, the storyline, and even the characters that we encounter. Dr. Kaufman will ask us things about whether we make friends easily, whether we like to have a drink to settle down, whether we like to roleplay during... Maybe we should just keep these secret. After this, Harry wakes up and realizes that his daughter is missing from the car. We get control of Harry to walk around the streets of Silent Hill. We mostly walk and look around, interacting with objects around the world. Most objects in the world can be moved by using the cursor. This lock we encounter, for example, requires us to pull the pin out and slide the bar to the right. This level of interactivity is pretty well done. It feels like you're in the shoes of Harry Mason, and that you have to actually interface with the world, sort of. It also feels like there's a controller between you and Harry Mason, but it's alright for the time. It's hard to judge this project from today's point of view, being spoiled by the immersiveness of things like VR. There's two businesses up the snow-covered streets, a clothes shop and an appliance store. Choosing one of these stores locks the other one out and sets us on a straight path from there on. There are multiple forks in the road like this throughout Shattered Memories. The team clearly wanted to differentiate each playthrough from the next and even encourage multiple playthroughs by locking out content behind your choices. Entering Teresa's, we'll find an answering machine behind the counter. The man on the recording is angry about someone taping over his wedding video. Wipe our wedding video? You knew that was the only copy. You can't replace that. Watch your backs. On the Wii version of the game, most of the phone calls and voice recordings actually come through the controller speaker, adding another level of immersion to the experience. We have to adjust the cameras in the back to get the door open. Heading to the playground, we have to shake some cans around and find a key to the door. Based on our answers to Dr. Kaufman's questionnaire, we'll either be able to enter the diner or the bar. Heading inside, Harry meets Sybil Bennett, or this world's version of Sybil Bennett. Harry tells Sybil about his missing daughter, but she's a little dismissive. We were in a car accident. When I came to, she was gone. Maybe she went to get help. She a clever girl? Sensible? Yeah, I think so. She's seven. Her name's Cheryl. Here's a photo. She has other business to attend to and says she'll help look for Cheryl after she's done. We get a call with no one on the other end during the conversation, and this gives us access to our phone. This will be our main menu throughout the course of the game. We can use it to dial different numbers that we find throughout our adventures. We can also use it to save or access our map. The most interesting feature, though, is the camera, which we'll use in a bit. Harry checks his GPS and heads back the way he came. Heading back into the playground, we find our first Echo photo. These are faint silhouettes in the world of Silent Hill. They are echoes of former events, and taking a picture of them will either give us a voice memo that we can listen to, or a text message on our phone. Daddy, I'm hurt. I thought this was a really interesting alternative to the text memos that we've been presented with in previous Silent Hill games. 
I don't necessarily think it always works better, though. It's mostly preference at this point. And I think the text memos provide the aspect of imagination. You're allowed to wonder about emotion in the writing and things unsaid. The voice memos are a little more cut and dry, but they add a little more overt emotion to the world, which can be interesting. We can also get echo messages, which will do the same thing as the photos, give us a message, text, or voice that we can experience. We find these by following static that we hear over Harry's phone, finding a small little monument which will then reveal the message. Harry heads back into the streets of Silent Hill. He gets a call from Cheryl, but it doesn't seem that she can hear him. After this conversation, the world begins to shift and we see our new other world. Since Shattered Memories is a reimagining of the first Silent Hill game, the developers took quite a few liberties with all of the common elements of the games. The other world is a perfect example of this. The other world is now, instead of a flaming red grating world, it's covered in ice, the frozen matter slowly taking over the streets when the change begins. This departure is a genuine attempt at trying to move the series in a new direction, which is something I always respect, especially for a one-off reimagining. With this otherworld transformation always comes a chase sequence. As Harry, we have to escape the otherworld, rushing away from hordes of enemies. This is really our only interaction with enemies in the game, as there are no combat encounters. We're forced to make our way through the world, rushing through doors, under bars, and climbing over walls. These scenarios can be particularly intense, music pumping through the speakers, the sounds of enemies just behind you. I feel like this replicates the feeling of running away from enemies in the original Silent Hill pretty well. My only complaint with this is it doesn't allow us to explore the other world. Our goal is to get out as fast as possible. I'd rather be able to spend some time in this environment, looking for things and experiencing the atmosphere, rather than just trying to get out of it as fast as I can. On the other side of the other world, Harry arrives at his home. Before he can enter, we are back in the office with Dr. Kaufman. He asks us multiple true or false questions and has us color in a drawing of a standard family. This will affect the next scene in the game, changing the colors of the surroundings. Harry's actions in the scene also depend on how carefully we colored the picture, whether we took our time or colored in the lines. When Harry approaches the home, there are other people inside of his house. The family that lives there doesn't know who Harry is or why he's there. Oh, hi there. What are you people doing in my house? This is our home. But Harry is just upset that people have moved into his home. Sybil is called to the house and she doesn't think Harry's daughter is inside. She offers to take him to the police station and look for Cheryl. Inside the car, Sybil and Harry have a conversation before the snow obscures their view. Sybil leaves to check their surroundings and doesn't return. We can move to the front seat and find a memento in the glove box. Mementos are another type of collectible hidden throughout the game. They are small items that we can inspect and store. Harry leaves the car and finds a cabin up the road. Through the back door, we can enter the larger forest. I like Shattered Memories because it lets us wander the forests and seek out new locations. It feels a little more open than it actually is, and there's not really that much stuff to be found, but it's an interesting concept nonetheless. We find a few more echo photos and messages. Harry heads across a bridge and gets a call from Sybil on his phone. She says that Harry ran off and he's worrying her, but he decides to go back to town. Harry finds a key and heads into another cabin, but the other world takes over again and he's chased through the forest. We're introduced to another mechanic here in that of the flare. We can grab these while running away from the monsters in the chase sequences. Using them will allow us some breathing room, as the enemies cannot attack us when holding one. We reach a certain room which has frozen figures of a family. We're able to solve our first puzzle here, in the middle of the other world. 
We get a voicemail on our phone. It's a woman complaining to her friend about their family's vacation. Not my idea of fun. Mom! Not now! I'm on the phone! Can you take care of this? <coughs> Mommy! <coughs> In the background, we can hear her daughter playing with a toy piano. We can mimic the keys she plays on the toy piano in the room and unlock the door outside. Once Harry escapes the other world, he's spit out beside Bryant Overlook. Climbing over a fence takes us onto the football field of the high school. Sybil calls again and tells us to meet her in the gymnasium. We have our third session with Dr. Kaufman, who asks us to plan out our ideal school day. He also asks us some more yes or no questions about our high school days. Throw out some words. Nod when they fit how you were at school. Shake your head if they don't. The choices that we make here will influence which ending we receive, and our school day schedule will influence which classes appear in the school courtyard. We have to grab a key to get inside the school. There are a ton of different echo messages, photos, mementos, and phone numbers that we can find throughout the school's halls. We have the choice between two classrooms here, both of which feature puzzles that have to be completed to move forward. In the art studio, we have to arrange statues and photo subjects in the correct way to cast numbers on the wall. These numbers will fill in the missing entries in a larger phone number that we can call to unlock the door ahead. Outside, Harry sees a figure in the hallway and receives a message from someone named Dahlia, showing off her new threads. We have to unlock another door with a code which is printed on the back of football players in a locker down the hall. Inside the gym, it seems a school reunion is going on, with only one participant, Michelle Valdez. Maybe I didn't treat you. Harry says he is looking for his daughter, Cheryl Mason, and Michelle tells him that Cheryl was above her in her class. There you go. That's an old photo. You say she ran off? No, we were in a car accident. That can't be my daughter. <laughs> How many Cheryl Masons could there be in a small town like this? She even looks like you. Michelle leads Harry into the principal's office, Mrs. Albright. We have to figure out the security questions to the computer to find Cheryl Mason's school records. To do this, we have to look around the room and find information on the principal. These puzzles can be pretty interesting, and having to search the world looking at documents or listening to messages requires attention. These puzzles do require some searching to find the right answer, even though they aren't as poetic as previous entries in the series. I'm more of a fan of the riddles presented in the team's silent entries. The computer freezes, but Harry can see that Cheryl Mason is in the computer. The address listed isn't the one he lives at, though, so he thinks they must have moved. Harry calls the phone number on file, and the woman named Dahlia answers. She knows Harry, but she tells him to leave her alone, and the world transforms again. We have another otherworld chase sequence, running through the school grounds this time. Harry arrives at a door with three ice figures blocking the way out. We get a voicemail from a student that wants us to take pictures of other students around the school. We have to find them while running around the other world. This is pretty intense as you not only have to run through the ice palace chased by monsters, but also have to stop and use your camera. The ice figures shatter after taking pictures of the students and we are allowed to leave. Michelle is outside and offers to give us a ride to the address on file for Cheryl. Michelle tells us her relationship woes as we follow her through the streets. We arrive at the Balkan nightclub and Michelle takes a call while we grab her keys from upstairs. Dahlia texts us that she's bored while we're looking for the keys. Downstairs, Michelle says that Harry must be married because he's wearing a ring, but he seems confused. You okay? No, I'm a bit lightheaded. I gotta go clear my head. 
In the bathroom, Harry looks at himself in the mirror, and when he returns, a woman is at the bar. Michelle nowhere to be found. Michelle? Who the hell is Michelle? Just practicing my signature. We ready to go? Where's Michelle? Funny. Come on, let's get going. I'm going to drive. You, Mr. Harry, are way over the limit. Stop. This is out of control. I came in here with a girl called Michelle. She was going to drive me to Simmons Street. Who are you? Are you on something? I'm Dahlia. This is Dahlia, and she acts like she's been there the entire time. She says she's going to take him to Cheryl, and the two head to Simmons Street. Dahlia says some strange things in the car, alluding to their relationship and always being drunk together. Harry still doesn't understand what's going on, though. The Dixon Bridge has been raised and the two can't get past. The controls are a little complicated, but there's a number that Harry can call, and someone will walk him through the controls so he can get the bridge down. When Harry gets back in the car, Dahlia scolds him because she thinks he's playing games with her. As the two are arguing, the other world begins taking over again, and the car is thrust off the side of the bridge into the frozen lake. Harry is trapped in the water-filled car, and we only have a short period of time to get out. We can tune the radio to a song, and the ice will melt away on the window, and we leave Dahlia in the car. Harry is distraught afterwards and passes out. We have another session with Kaufman, and he grills us about death. Dr. K has us choose between multiple pictures and decide which are sleeping and which are dead. Our choices here will affect the end of the game slightly. After this, we see Sybil dragging Harry off and saving him. We can actually not escape the car and just wait until Harry drowns, and this will mostly have the same result. Dahlia. Who's Dahlia? A girl. The car went into the river. She drowned. Another crash? Sybil doesn't seem to know who Dahlia is. She says she pulled Harry's file at the station, and before she can get to the good stuff, the world transforms again, freezing Sybil and the walls around them. Harry wheels his way through the other world until he can no longer, and begins to run. Eventually, ice covers one of Harry's exits, and we have another puzzle. The voicemail we receive shows us a conversation between this father and his daughter. There's a specific song that she loves on the Alcamilla radio station. We have to tune into the station and request a song, using a poster and some deduction to figure out which one the girl wanted to hear. Choosing the right song will cause the ice to evacuate, and we can head into the Alcamilla lobby. A nurse has crashed an ambulance into the lobby, and she has a head wound. That yours? No. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm not making any sense, am I? It's okay. She decides she wants to go home to bandage herself up, and Harry decides to go with her. This is Shattered Memories' version of Lisa Garland. Harry walks along the streets with her, partaking in some witty banter along the way. Yeah, but he got to sit down a lot. A nurse is on her feet all day, and night. He says Cheryl likes collecting bugs, and the two head into Lisa's apartment. Harry says he's going to head out, but Lisa wants to thank him before he leaves. We can watch TV here or try to peek into Lisa's room. The choice will affect how the game profiles us. Lisa gets a headache and asks Harry to get her some pills. She decides to go to sleep and tells Harry to leave. We have another session with Dr. K, and he's complaining about human guilt. Whether animals would come and eat us in the night? Now we have supermarkets, bottled water, and 38 caliber home security. So what keeps us awake at night? More often than not, guilt. He tells us a story about Prince Wilhelm, who is in love with Celestine. She doesn't want the king to marry her to the prince, but the king ignores her. When running away from the marriage consummation, Celestine is killed by a bull. We have to then order the figures as to who is the most and least responsible, or rather, guilty. Our choices will affect dialogue at the end of the game. 
We head to Simmons Street trying to find Cheryl, but Lisa calls us on the way. Lisa? Harry. Oh, Harry. What's wrong? I don't feel well. I woke up. I had such a terrible dream. When Harry arrives at the apartment, he sees Lisa die in front of him, and Sybil arrives at the worst time possible. You bastard. I didn't shut up! Sybil is pretty angry, finally fed up with Harry's lies. Before she can take him in, the world transforms and we have another chase sequence. I think it was at this point in the game that the sequences started to get a little repetitive. There's also something to be said about the blandness of the other world over time. I think it starts out as an interesting idea, but they don't really expand upon it. In the other Silent Hill games, the other world changed with each area we traveled to. It would reflect the story and the area we were in, creating a new and interesting atmosphere each time. This one just kind of stays static and doesn't really revolutionize the original idea. We have another puzzle here. Hearing a voicemail on the phone, we have to figure out the girl's favorite gumball colors. They happen to correspond with the toucan mascot, and to find his colors, we have to venture back out into the other world. Matching the colors to the gumballs clears our way forward, and Harry heads out into the mall. The mall hides all manner of collectibles and items that we need to progress. We find a key hidden in a toy train, and we can travel into either one of two stores, new looks or celebrations. We get a call from Michelle saying that her boyfriend has arrived and they're going to get food, but her phone cuts out before Harry can get any answers. Inside the salon, we can find the code for the security pad by turning on the hot water and letting the steam reveal the code. Most of the puzzles in the game are pretty interesting. Like I said before, I don't think they're necessarily as poetic or ancient in feeling as the original games were, but it's clear this game was going for a more modern tone anyways. Though the style isn't the same, the feeling of having to pay attention and try to look for clues is still there. Harry heads into the theater and sees himself on the big screen, a pretty terrifying sight. Inside the pawn shop, we can do some Rube Goldberg action to get the key and head out back. We finally arrive at the apartment that was listed on Cheryl's file and enter. Inside, Harry finds a stuffed toucan and pictures of Cheryl as a child. Cheryl? Sweetie, is that you? You've been gone for so long, I started to worry. Sweetie? Hello. You here for my daughter? She quickly recognizes him, but he doesn't know her. She says Cheryl must be at the lighthouse, and the woman says they're soulmates. This is Harry's wife, and before he can get answers, the world transforms again. We're subjected to one final chase sequence, which can be pretty easy to get lost in. This labyrinth and its confusing corridors can have us running in circles pretty quickly, so it's best to pay attention to our surroundings. We'll fall down some holes here, seeing the images from the tapes at the beginning of the game. Harry finds a room with pictures of him and his daughter and drops one before he falls asleep on the bed. We have another session with Dr. K where he asks us about marriage. We have phrases like the honeymoon is over to remind us how quickly marriage is sour. You think I'm being cynical? Divorce does that to you. Come on, you think marriage can really last? Dr. K mostly represents a jaded, cynical therapy, a true cross from actual, professional psychiatrists. It's a probing form of a psych profile, which is a horror of its own. People that are afraid of opening up, being forced to by a man who's constantly prodding, poking, and generally degrading their emotions and choices. It's an interesting and subtle choice for the game's new mechanic. 
He asks us some more yes or no questions based on marriage and has us group up six different couples. There's a lot of options here, and grouping up these couples can affect how events will play out shortly after this. Harry wakes up in his apartment again, Michelle looking over him. He tells her that he needs to get to the lighthouse, and she offers to have John and her drive him there. John and Michelle quickly get into an argument and break up, stopping the car. The way the breakup happens is dependent on the answers we gave in the previous session. They just leave Harry hanging, and we have to exit the car and travel the rest of the way on foot. Harry heads down into the sewers, and it's definitely not nearly as atmospheric as previous installments. One of my biggest problems with this game is its lack of sound design. There often isn't really any music, because we have no combat. Monsters aren't chasing us outside of the Otherworld sequences, so there's no terrifying monster sounds off in the distance. The game is very exploratory, and clearly it was going for that tone, but the silence really isn't that terrifying for me. I think some of the scariest parts of the game are some of the most repetitive, the Otherworld sequences. Outside of that, it just doesn't really provide that Silent Hill aura that we're used to. We get another call from Cheryl, and she tells us, through static, not to find her because it's not safe. Harry exits the sewers and finds a back exit from the souvenir shop. This leads him to Annie's bar, where Michelle is drinking away her woes. She tells us we need a boat to cross the lake and get to the lighthouse. Harry leaves Michelle, and we have our final session with Dr. K. He has almost a perverted lust for our deep mental intricacies. He asks us to divide up pictures between sexual and non-sexual. This choice can influence our ending based on what we choose. Dr. K says these represent death and we're outside of the bar. We briefly head through the lakeside amusement park, significantly less scary when covered in snow. Eventually, we crawl our way down into a swan boat ride, and Harry makes his way to the docks. On the boat, Dahlia is drinking on the bed. She suggests that they float on the lake and have some fun. Harry wants to head to the lighthouse, though. Dahlia reluctantly pilots the boat towards Harry's destination. We'll be at the lighthouse in about 20 minutes. It's a slow boat. Why won't you take this seriously? Sorry. Cheryl is in trouble. Cheryl is always in trouble. What do you know about Cheryl? Very little. I try not to pry into your family life. You have the same name as my wife. Stop it. Stop it. Can't we just relax for once? Dahlia gets Harry to drink and he relaxes a little bit. Harry wakes up in the other world in his boxers. Outside, the lake is frozen, and it's stopped the boat in its tracks. Harry heads out onto the frozen lake, and we get a few texts and calls on the way. One of Cheryl's mugshot. We're assailed by monsters, and the tower's light fends off the group of enemies. The water melts, and Harry is forced to swim to the tower, seeing images of frozen figures in the water. He goes unconscious, and Sybil saves him again. You're not stopping me! I'm not here to stop you! I didn't have to fish you out of the water, did I? Stop talking! You can't talk me out of this! I'm not here to stop you! I pulled your file at the station. I told you that, right? If you're telling the truth, this doesn't make sense. But I think you are telling the truth. I believe you think you're Harry Mason. Hell, I believe you are Harry Mason. But Harry Mason was killed in a car crash 18 years ago. Harry heads into the lighthouse and Sybil leaves. Inside, Dr. Kaufman scalds us for not understanding his process. It's finally revealed that the person in the seat has been Cheryl this whole time. The term is complicated grief, but it's simple, isn't it? A young girl. Her parents don't get along. She blames herself, as all children do. Then daddy dies. What's a girl to do? Harry died when Cheryl was a child, and she's made this version of him up in her head. You've been with me for so long. 
I always will be. Harry freezes and the screen turns to static as we see the tape from the beginning of the game again. Then we start to see images of Cheryl's life. We see the domestic abuse that Cheryl's mother was putting Harry through, and the game ends. This is only one ending of Silent Hill Shattered Memories. Shattered Memories has two types of endings. The first is the one that happens in Dr. K's office. The one I already described was the broken ending. A lot of things influence which ending we get, and Shattered Memories' endings are more akin to Silent Hill 2's ending structure, where it's based on multiple things throughout your playthrough that aren't very obvious. The broken ending generally has Harry ignoring alcohol and sexual activities and concentrating on finding Cheryl. By acting more unfriendly, we can unlock the Bearer of Guilt ending. This sees Cheryl not being able to forgive Harry. Harry asks her to forget him, and his body freezes as he crumbles to the floor. The Hero Forever ending can be unlocked by not being interested in Dr. K's help, just trying to fake the answers. In this ending, Cheryl tells Harry that he is her hero. She's unable to lose him, and they hug each other, tears streaming down her face. The second type of ending we get is the videotape that plays after these endings. We already talked about the wicked and weak ending. This was obtained by being more unfriendly in the interviews. The love lost ending is achieved by mostly being aligned with the broken ending, being more family friendly. We see a video of Harry and his wife saying goodbye as he leaves, him moving out after their divorce. The Sleaze and Sirens ending is a found tape of Harry making a sleazy video with Michelle and Lisa that Cheryl supposedly found. The Drunk Dad ending can be found by acting more obsessed with alcohol throughout the playthrough, staring at alcohol you see throughout the game and answering questions in a manner that aligns with this. In this ending, Cheryl is filming Harry as he approaches the house late at night, drunk, he wants Cheryl to get him another drink, and he gets angry before the camera shuts off. There's also a UFO ending, of course. To unlock it, we have to have beaten the game. We have to call a number and take photographs of UFOs all over town, 13 in total. We get an animated cutscene of Dr. K, Cheryl thinking that Harry was abducted by aliens. James tries to enter the room, and Dr. K says that's one of his couple's therapy patients. This whole town, it's really a giant spaceship. James? <sighs> Wrong day again. See you tomorrow, James. One of my couple's therapy patients. Haven't seen his wife in a while. The variety of endings in the game is fantastic and is probably one of the best things about it. It allows each player to have a wildly different experience. So... What really happened in Silent Hill Shattered Memories? Well, this one's a little more complicated. Most of the story of Shattered Memories is explained to us throughout the course of the game. When Cheryl's young, her mother and father divorced for a reason that's based on the choices in our playthrough. He died in a car accident, and Cheryl couldn't face his death. She seems to have imagined her father and an alternate reality where he lived throughout the course of the game. His actions are chosen by us in the real world and Cheryl in the game. This affects how Cheryl perceives him and based on those choices, the perceived version of him will eventually encounter Cheryl at the end of the game. Silent Hill Shattered Memories is a pretty decent experiment. It presents a lot of really interesting mechanics and choices throughout the adventure. Its choice mechanics and psychological profiling system offer the player different playthroughs with a variety of changes, not only in the ending, but in the environments and character portrayals. It's an incredibly interesting way to structure a game, and I commend the developers for going this route. Interacting with the world feels good and even not on the Wii version of the game. 
The game is 10 times more atmospheric on that system though as we get calls and voice memos through our controller speaker. We can draw notes on the map physically instead of the main character doing it for us. And of course, we don't get the motion controls. It's still a good experience off of the Wii though, that feels like an interesting spin-off to Silent Hill. Taking the combat out of Silent Hill was also an interesting choice, one that makes sense in the context of the system it was developed for. I think what it was replaced with, and what was lost overall though, isn't really worth it. The chase sequences become repetitive, and there really aren't any monster designs to be talked about here, because there really only is one monster in the game. Pushing the other world to the other end of that spectrum, from literally hot to literally cold, is a bold choice, separating the game from this series entirely. But this is where we come to the overall problem with Silent Hill Shattered Memories. It's not really a Silent Hill game. It's honestly the first game in the series that I can say that about. It's designed specifically to be a reimagining of the first game in the series, but it bears too little resemblance to that game to really give it the same moniker. I feel like the team could have gotten away with calling this game a spiritual successor, changing some of the names, and it would have been a fantastic Wii title. This really, in the end, comes down to Konami wanting to sell more copies, though. But the characters in the games that return, Lisa Garland and Dahlia in particular, have really nothing to do with the ones previous. You could make the argument that they didn't want to remake the game, so they wanted to separate themselves from the first entry, but what's the point of even calling it a reimagining at that point? There's no cult, no ritual, no Alessa or Flauros, it's just something entirely different. That's totally fine, and I generally find it one of the most interesting non-team silent games because of that, but it just doesn't need to market itself as a reimagining of the first game. All that being said, I genuinely respect this game for trying some new things and not leaning too hard on past entries. This is what people were asking for in Silent Hill, trying to go in a new direction and revolutionize the series overall. It was an incredibly interesting experience and I think, as a whole, it worked for me. Again, I feel like I'm repeating myself at this point, but I don't think it holds a candle to the team Silent entries, but it's still one of the best western developed Silent Hill games. Silent Hill Shattered Memories received generally positive reviews. Most of the critics praised its visuals, and some focused negatively on the lack of combat sequences and puzzle-based exploration. The next game in the series would be the last mainline entry overall, but we'll get to that next time. Bye, Dad.